Well, as per usual, it's another beautiful day in El Paso. I personally would want to go golfing, but a lot of you might want to go fishing. Or do you? Maybe you don't. I'll explain the whole thing, hop aboard, and join me for another edition of Computer Train. It's time for Computer Train, the weekly TV program that trains you how to use your computer. With your host, El Paso Community College faculty member Russ Meyer. All right, let me explain. So first of all, I mentioned fishing. Uh, let's talk about fishing for a second. One of the things I never understood fishing when I was young, get a pole and rod and you throw it in the water, and then I was like, okay, now what? I don't know, you just sit there for hours. Uh, if I was in a psychology on the bench, they would say word association, and they would say fishing, I would probably say sunburn. Uh, the only fishing I did was a lot in my early 20s, maybe in the establishments around El Paso, I did some fishing. But don't worry, I employed, like a good fisherman, I employed catch and release. But obviously in this computer train show, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a different kind of fishing. But the same concept, what we're trying to do in real fishing is we're trying to trick a fish into thinking they're about to bite some food when really they're not. So let's talk about it. First of all, it's not spelled like the real world, uh, word fishing that we're familiar with. Instead of an F, we have a PH. And they came up with that. Uh, apparently the hackers in the day, they used to use PH for any F word. Uh, the kids around, if something was fat, P-H-A-T, it was apparently very good. So the fishing that I'm referring to is with the pH. It actually is a benefit because if you want to do a little bit more research on the topic, you don't have to type in the actual word fishing because of course you'd get a million websites related to the actual uh, fishing exercise. You can type the pH which would redirect you into that. You have bad actors out there who are trying to trick you into giving usually information about accounts or usernames. So kind of the same thing that we do in real fishing. But let's take a look at some uh, particular topics. So what are we trying to accomplish there? What are they trying to accomplish there? Of course, like lots of scams, they're trying to steal. And they're stealing using a variety of methods. Um, I'm going to key in, of course, on the computer-related ones, but you've got to remember that they're trying to do it lots of ways. All right, so a lot of the phishing that's going on right now is they'll send you emails with erroneous information and they'll try to trick you into thinking that the email that you're getting is from a reputable site or a reputable company that you're doing um, business with. Okay, so we have to make sure we are able to spot those kinds of things. This one especially used with the elderly because elderly don't use emails and websites as much as the younger generation does, but of course they all still have phones, so they're trying to do a lot of phone calls. This one is also pretty prevalent. Um, this is used everywhere, especially like in El Paso. We just had a hailstorm a few weeks ago. Maybe damaged your car, maybe damaged your roof. So you've got people that come and portray like they're a business that can help you when they're really not a, a business that will do that. All right, so scams, we got to start being able to look for certain things that will tip us off that we're, these are not reputable sites and reputable emails. Okay, first of all, alarmist message and threats. Like if you don't do this in the next 24 hours, your account is going to be closed. Okay, a business is usually not going to do that. Okay, promises of money for little or no effort. Um, remember, you get what you pay for kind of thing. That's going to hold true in these kinds of activities also. Okay, deals that sound too good to be true, same kind of thing. You know, if you have a roofer come to your door and he gives you some kind of price that is extremely low, you can probably bet that it's going to be one of this. You're not going to be getting a good quality roof. Okay, request to donate. So this happens. We have tra tragedies throughout the world. We have reputable companies that do that, like the Red Cross. But then all of a sudden, these websites spring up and emails are shot out to help those people in that certain location. And quite a few, some of them are not reputable, so you're just sending your money away. All right, and one of the ways that we can spot this is because a lot of the people that do this are not from America, and they don't have, you know, decent English skills. So what we can do is we can look in an email or a website and we can look at did they use proper spelling, did they use proper punctuation, proper tenses, things like that. So I have an example of that. All right, so let's look at a couple of things here. Here's a sample that I got off the internet. Um, it's a little uh, out of focus, but I'll explain some of the components. 
So first of all, it says, Dear Visa Customer. Okay, so that's a generic salutation. Usually when a company that you're involved with sends you an email, which they do from time to time, and I'll show you one that I got from Walgreens, they're usually going to use your name because your name is in their database. So when they send out an email, they will grab that information, and it's done through a mail merge, which I've shown how to do on the show, where we have the information stored on one file, we write up a generic email, and then we translate that information into that. So it's usually not going to be generic like that. Okay, so this is to inform you of a record update. So they're always updating your records all the time. Uh, there's very few reasons that they need to update your records, and usually they will call you and ask you some information to make sure that they're talking to the right person. When this is written, it didn't go out to the end. It automatically started on a new line, which would be word wrap. But if you look at it, there's plenty of space for the other word like your. Your would have been over here. Okay, but what they did probably at that time is they pressed the enter key to cause it to go on a new line, which is not something you would do in word processing. You would just naturally let it word wrap. Here we have an e a URL for a website that is telling you to go to. On the next slide and then on uh, our web browser, I'm going to show you how to see the actual address that you would go to if you clicked on the link. What you see here and the exact location that you're sent to for a URL can be two different things. Once again, I've shown you that here on the show where we can type actual words and we can change the words into an actual web address that the user doesn't see. Okay, so that's usually a good thing, but here it could be a bad thing. All right, and of course here it's always something about immediate action. You have to do this right now. Okay, if you fail to update your Visa card, it's going to be temporarily blocked. Okay, so if we get emails like that, we have to, you know, use some common sense and pay attention to some other things that will help us spot that it's invalid. This is related to PayPal. All right, so the first thing I want you to notice is all the places they use the actual company name. PayPal is with two capital P's. But if you notice in the email address in some locations, the PAL is in a lowercase p. There is no way that would happen. Emails from companies go through several layers of editing because they want to strike the right tone, they want to use the right terminology, they don't want to be offensive, they do want to give information, but they would never mistype or type differently their actual company name. That would never happen. Okay, another thing here is we have the word wrapping issue again. Okay, so if you notice these sentences, it went all the way to the end of the email. This one did not. Once again, if you're using a normal email generation program or Microsoft Word or anything like that, word wrapping is automatic. If there's enough room to put the word, it will put it. If not, then it'll move it. Okay, so we wouldn't go out to the edge of the paper like this. We have the warning. Okay, you have 48 hours. Okay, so once again, they're always going to threaten about if you don't take this kind of action in this amount of time, your account's going to be closed, it's going to be locked, you won't be able to use your credit card. Uh, none of that is true. And here's where I'm going to show you that if you point to a URL in an email and you just hover your mouse on the URL, you get a screen tip. So remember what screen tips are. Screen tips are just about anywhere on our computer, Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, where if you hover on it, it opens up a little window and it tells you, gives you a little bit of information about that tool or that uh, command you're using. In the case of URLs, the screen tip usually will display the actual web address. And often, because these are not legitimate sites that went through the process of getting a domain name, like epcc.edu or visa.com, is they'll have this. Okay, I've never shown this on this little bit higher level technical stuff that most people don't know. But just to give you a quick description, when you type in an address like epcc.edu, it actually is translated by the computer to an IP address. And the IP address is a four section numbering system. Okay, so a lot of times when you see these bad URLs and you hover it, you won't even see a web address. You'll see these weird numbering systems which is the actual numerical address because they could not follow through and get a domain name legitimately. All right, so once again, a simple email has a lot of clues for us to look at 
to, to make sure that we're looking at a good email. All right, so a couple of quick things we can protect ourselves. One I just described, use some common sense, read the email, and notice a couple of things about it. Spelling, grammar, did they spell the name of the company wrong? Um, did they threaten, you know, if you don't do some kind of action in a certain amount of time? All of those are tip-offs. All right, so one of the things you can do that I have described uh, in previous uh, computer training when we did that security one is one is a smart screen filter. This is a little utility that's going to help us spot these invalid websites that we go to. Okay, so it assists with phishing attempts and malware. Remember that term. So we have the term software, which are applications we install on our computer. Mal meaning bad, so basically bad software that are going to do bad things to our computer. Okay, it'll also examine the website addresses and compare it to a list. So Microsoft keeps a list of all of these web addresses that they have determined to be invalid sites. So if you go to one of those sites and that picks it up, it will compare it to that list and let you know. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole process like I did in the previous show, but basically it tells you that it's bad. It allows you to let them know if you hit a site that you think is bad, or contrarily, if you hit a site that Microsoft says is bad and you think is good, you can set an option to send them that. Of course, they do research constantly with all of these sites. Okay, if you're doing downloading a file, same kind of thing. They have a list of software sites where we do downloads. And if you're trying to download a file that is on that list, they'll let you know that this file may be coming from a, you know, a bad site and it might have malware involved in it. All right, so smart screen is a setting in our Microsoft Edge web browser. Other web browsers also have a setting like that, not exactly with the same name, but whatever browser you're using, you should uh, research it and turn on. I want to show you quickly how to do it in uh, Microsoft Edge. Okay, so I have my browser running. What we're going to do is remember with our browsers, we have a variety of settings that we do, and that's in these three dots right here. The uh, settings, there's a wide variety. I've talked about pop-ups in the past. I've talked about other security issues. So if we go to that, then we're going to come down to the bottom here for settings. Okay, got to scroll down because it's actually one of the advanced settings. So I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to go to advanced settings. Okay, and it's towards the bottom here. right here help protect me from malicious sites and downloads so websites you visit and any kind of software you're trying to download and you want to use the smart screen filter so my recommendation highly recommend that we turn that option on all right so the other one is virus protection uh, I've discussed lots of times on this show about viruses we've discussed software Lots of side to uh, topics. You want to have some kind of virus protection. Microsoft uh, has protection. The one that uh, is free and the new version is called Microsoft Security Essentials. And if you don't want to use that one, there's purchased ones, there's other free downloads. Uh, just make sure you are doing it. There's a lot of good ways to do it, but there's one bad way to do it, and that is not to do it. All right, so in this email, I get my prescriptions through Walgreens and I've set up a reminder so that if a prescription is coming up for renewal it'll automatically send me an email to remind me one of the nice things is I can just reply to the email and set it up automatically but I wanted to show you is let's say we this was from some uh, non-reputable site so here's for instance a link that they'll have me go to so notice that that is not a URL in the form that we're familiar with www dot or whatever it is we're going to I'm going to hover and I want to look on the bottom left of this screen for a second which will show me what the URL is. So I'm not going to click on it, I'm going to hover on it. And you can see here, you know, if they zoom in, it's www.walgreens.com and then it's the rest of the address to do what this is actually doing. So it actually takes me to my account where I can log in and I can check, 
check my settings. One of the settings they want me to check is if I actually want the name of the prescription to be in there. Uh, usually I don't. So uh, one of the things I wanted to show you though is if you have a URL you can just hover on it and see what the actual address is that you're going to. Is it the address of the company that's from the email? And if it's, if it's a non-reputable email, it's not going to match. Uh, just a second ago, it would not be going to Visa. It would not be going to PayPal. This one would not be going to Walgreens. Okay, so quick thing you can do, just hover and check the URL. Another thing you can do is if you're feel, uh, fearful is when you get a URL, you can actually copy it and paste it into the address bar yourself instead of clicking on the link there. Then it will detect whether that's an actual link. And then, of course, if you have the smart screen filter turned on, that will also help you. Okay, so the point is that phishing is done quite a bit, but very few people fall for it if they're following a couple of things. You have your eyeballs open, as I've told you with computers on everything. You're paying attention to detail, and you're using a little bit of common sense. You shouldn't fall for any kind of phishing attack. A company's not going to ask for your username and uh, password through an email. Okay? So be careful out there and watch that phishing. Don't get a sunburn. All right, in this little segment, completely off the topic of phishing, uh, I answered a question for a friend of mine in Excel who's a principal at a high school, had a list of students, and they had a printout. And they wanted something visually to separate so they could see different. And I think they were doing the standard s senior, junior, sophomore, freshman. So I have an example like that, really easy to do. And I'm sure that question is being asked by a lot of different people that work with Excel with lots of lists. So let's take a look at our data for a second. I've used this file before in Computer Train. It's kind of a standard Excel list of uh, employee information. So what I need to do is I need to print it for somebody and they're going to use that information to work on different types of medical plans. And what they've asked me to do is they've asked me to sort the medical plans so all the employees with the same medical plan are together. So that's easy to do and I'll do that in two seconds here. The other part of it though is they'd like some kind of, and I'm going to put just a line, so that when one section of one medical plan ends, there's going to be a line, so there's a visual clue so the person can easily see one medical plan section from another. Okay, that incorporates the concepts of uh, conditional formatting, a little bit different, maybe a smidgen harder than what we have done in the past, but not too bad. All right, so first of all, they want me to sort this, all of these employees, by the medical plan. They want them all together. Okay, I'm going to sort them very easy. If it's a single field sort, which means single column, all you have to do is click on the column you want to sort on. Your active cell can be anywhere. Don't have to highlight that column. Then on the data ribbon up here, we have the two sorting buttons that we use for single column or single field sorts. One is ascending, which is alphabetical. The other is descending, alphabetical, the other way, Z to A. And you can see the icons display that. So first part is let's sort it alphabetically A to Z. Okay, so we have exactly what we want. All the medical plans called Family 1000 are together. If I scroll down, we have Family 2500, etc., etc. If I were to print that, however, for the person, you can see when they're looking down this long list of people, it's very hard to see where one stops, which is right here, and the next one starts. Okay, on and on and on and on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line for them right where that one section starts. Okay, it's a conditional formatting. It also brings into play another concept about cell referencing that we've talked about. So I'm going to quickly review both of those. All right, so to do this, if I want the border or the line that I'm going to draw to go all the way across the row, I would have to select all the data. If you just wanted the line to be on this column, you would only have to select this column. But to make it easy for them, I'm going to draw a line all the way across the screen. So you must select all of the cells that you're going to put conditional formatting on. 
Okay, so we'll select all the employees here. All right, so conditional formatting is on the home ribbon. Okay, so we're going to go to the home ribbon. Then conditional formatting is in the styles group. Remember the whole purpose of this is to get Excel to do the formatting based upon some conditions I set up or rules that I set up or criteria. It has a couple of different names depending on the specific tool that you use. So I'm going to go to conditional formatting. The one I need doesn't match any of these. None of these will work. What I need to do is I need to create my own individual rule that follows what I'm trying to accomplish. So I'm going to go to new rule. All right, in there what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this option right here. Use a formula to determine which cells to format. Okay, so I'm going to build a formula. Now when we build the formula, it means equal sign. So remember when we build formulas in Excel in general, they all have to start with an equal sign. And essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Excel when this cell is not equal to this cell, I want you to draw a line. So eventually when we get down to that next section, the first value in that section will not be like the last value in the previous section, so Excel is going to draw a line. So it's not really that difficult, but it does bring into play some cell referencing. Okay, so the rule I'm going to set up is if E3 is not equal to, so to do the not equal to, we do less than, greater than. And we're going to say if it's not equal to the previous cell, which is E2. Okay, so notice that, very important here, that we notice that Excel put the dollar signs on the column and the row. Remember what that is called, that's called absolute cell referencing. What it basically means is, when it copies this formatting to the rest of the worksheet, it will always only compare E3 against E2. That's not what we want. As we go down, we want to compare E4 to E3, then E5 to E4. So we want it to keep adjusting down the row. But when it copies the formatting to the right or to the left, we don't want it to point to column F or column G or column C. We always want to point to column E. So this is a mixed reference. We need column absolute, so we need the dollar sign in front but we need row relative, no dollar sign. Okay, so I'm going to edit my formula a little bit, and I'm going to delete the dollar sign in front of the 3, and I'm going to delete the dollar sign in front of the 2. So now when it copies this formatting all over the place, it will always use column E, but it will be 3 and 2, 4 and 3, 5 and 4, etc., all the way down. All right, so the last thing I need to do is I need to set the format. When that happens, what do I want to show? So I'm going to go to Format. And to make this very simple, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a border. So I'm going to go to the Borders tab. And I'll put a line. Just so we can see a little bit easier, I'll change the color to red. And I'm going to tell it I want it on the bottom of that last row, basically. So then I'll click OK. And I'll click OK. All right, so now we can see here was family 1000. So now on this one, it checked this one against this one. It's not equal to. This one's 1000, this is 1500, so it drew a line. Apparently, there's only one employee in the family 1500. So it drew a line again. Now we're in the family 1250 or 2500. Eventually when that changes, it drew a line. Okay, so that's extremely helpful. It's not only here, but especially when I print it out. Now when I print it out, a person will be able to go through it a little bit easier. Every time they see a red line, that means that's a different section of a different medical plan and the cost that would be associated with purchasing that medical plan. 
So it's conditional formatting, little higher level because you have to set your own formula and then the big key to getting it right is you must change the cell referencing depending on your example, the relative, absolute, or in our case we used a mixed style, column absolute, row relative. All right, last quick example. Uh, I asked if I have a little bit more time. Got a couple minutes, so we're going to squeeze this in. This is not something that happens very often, but again, a friend of mine asked me, so I like to bring those questions to computer train. They asked me that in File Explorer, when it assigns the drives, remember, drive letters are assigned with letters. So the hard drive is the C. Depending on the configuration of your computer, each drive gets a different letter. And the computer essentially does that automatically, but what if you want to change it? Uh, the only time I really would, would recommend something like that is if you have a computer with multiple uh, USB drives or ports, you might want to put those down at the end of the alpha, uh, alphabet. So if you had three USB ports, you might want to make them X, Y, and Z. Okay, so you can assign whatever you want. To see what they're currently assigned to, you go to File Explorer, which we've discussed many times on this uh, show. All right, so if I go to File Explorer and I click on this PC, here's what I've got right now. I've got the hard drive, which is the letter C. By the way, that cannot be changed. The drive that has the operating system cannot be changed. Okay, I have a flash drive plugged in, so my flash drive is assigned to the letter D. And this computer that I'm using has a DVD CD drive, which is assigned the letter E. Okay, so if you had a particular reason to do that, which is not very common, you can do it. Okay, so what you have to do is on your start button down here at the bottom left, okay, instead of clicking on it, you're going to use your right mouse button and right click. Okay, so this is getting into a little bit more system type stuff, so be careful. All right, so one of the options here is disk management. So these are called drives or disks. Okay, so you can see disk, drive. Okay, we usually just use the term drive. Okay, so I'm going to go to disk management. In that window, it's going to tell me the drives that are assigned. So once again, here's my C drive, the hard drive. Here's the D, which is my flash drive. And here is my CD-ROM. So if I wanted to change one, I can right click on it and in that menu is the option to change the drive letter. Okay, So we would go to change drive letter and then I'm not going to follow through and change it but you could change it and assign whatever letter you want. Okay, So there's the location where I could change the assignment of my flash drive. Okay, Extreme word of warning here. You don't want to do it on older computers that especially are pointing to drives like floppy drives where software might be looking for things there. That's why we don't want to change the C drive. If older software is looking for files on a particular drive and you change the letter, it might still be looking for the B which you change to the F. So this software is not going to work properly anymore. Also, if you remember in File Explorer, you can set up shortcuts. Okay, so that in Windows 10, that's called Quick Access. So if I put anything here in my Quick Access, which is pointing to the letter D, and then I change it, if I click on the Quick Access icon, it will say I can't find that resource. So be very careful with that. They had a particular reason where they wanted to organize it. They had a computer with quite a few different drives, so it made sense for them. But for the average user, maybe not. But if you try and do it, be extremely careful. Well, I hope you enjoyed this edition of Computer Train. Talked you a little bit more about security, which I always try to weave in. I never try to get out of a show with talking a little bit about Excel. And then you could change your drives. So now it's such a beautiful day. Let's go out and go fishing. No, let's go golfing. I'll see you on the next episode of Computer Train. <laughs>